Hey guys, welcome to the Life's Worth Living podcast. I'm your host, John Gossett. So grateful to have you back for another week of the podcast and thankful for all of your questions that you submitted for last week's episode. I was really nervous not having a guest and uh, doing it all by myself that week. And so hopefully you got something out of it. If you're interested in submitting questions or suggestions for the podcast, reach out at 435 277-0235 277-0235 and let me know what your thoughts are. I'll get back to each of you. Um, you can email me also at lifesworthlivingfoundation at gmail.com. So tonight I want to throw a big shout out to our sponsor, GTM Builders. They are Tooele County's premier home builder. Uh, they allow us to record in their beautiful model home here in Overlake. If you're interested in building a new home, reach out to GTM Builders at gtmbuilders.com or visit one of their beautiful model homes in Tooele Valley. Tonight's episode is brought to you by A. Warner Homes Real Estate. If you're in the market for buying or selling, interest rates are great. Uh, reach out to A. Warner Homes Real Estate. Give them a call at 801-867-5078. So tonight, we've got a special guest, Rachel Curfew. And she is a coach, an anxiety coach, right? Yes, right. So we're going to answer a question that, that I got last week from Cami Perkins. And uh, maybe I should read the question. Yeah. I'm going to read it. What the heck? Mm. Let's see. The question was, maybe have an episode to talk about women who are afraid to admit that we can't do it all. And reaching out for help is not a weakness. And uh, so I really appreciated that. I'm a guy. I know nothing about it. So I brought in the pro. So I have been a woman for a few years. (laughs) I'm not. So so thank you for coming and and talking to us. So tell us a little bit about yourself and and, uh, what got you into coaching. Yeah, so I'm what's called a strategic intervention coach, It's um, but I do specialize in anxiety. And um, most people don't uh, grow up thinking, oh, I can't wait to grow up and talk about anxiety every single day. But um, And that's, I didn't either, but that's where I've been led. I got into anxiety because I had some anxiety growing up and um, not debilitating or terrible, but enough that um, you know, it was a little bit of a struggle, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it, how to express it or to explain it to people at the time. And it kind of, I've kind of started figuring it out on my own when I was in college. I started realizing I, I'm not actually um, shy, which is what I'd been labeled. I was like, I think I'm actually afraid. I'm, af- I'm nervous. I'm anxious. I'm afraid of everything. And so, um, I was plugging along doing okay until I fast forward a few years and I was not in a good marriage at the time. Anxiety was now off the charts and all of a sudden I have children with anxiety. And it's really funny how you will, um, you'll do a lot for yourself, but you'll do a whole lot more for your kid. And there's nothing worse, and and this kind of feeds maybe into our question a little bit, but I was at a time that was dark in my life. I felt alone in my life. Um, I had some people around me, but not my close friends or family. I was living away, and children that were struggling, and we were doing counseling and therapies of every kind you can imagine, and my children are still suffering. They're still struggling. And I'm trying to juggle a hundred balls in the air and it feels like the whole world is crashing down around me. And I feel like the biggest failure of all because I can't help my kid. And so I got selfish. One time in my whole life, I decided to be really selfish and I decided I'm going to find the answers. I Like I said, all these counselors and different resources, they all had good puzzle pieces and we were getting good help, but it wasn't what my family needed. It wasn't the whole puzzle. And I just decided, yeah, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to study it. I'm going to figure out the answers. So I've been now working with people all over the world who have anxiety for about 10 years now. Wow. Yeah. So um, the really great thing is, There's lots of reasons why people have anxiety, but many of those reasons are things that can be easily turned around quickly and easily and with the right tools and the right strategies. It's it's really not a hard process. It's just nobody teaches us how to do it. 
It doesn't. So in our field in suicide prevention, Mm -hmm. we see a lot of people that suffer with anxiety. And it seems like the common theme of the people that that we see in prevention self-medicate because of the anxiety. So whether they they turn that to some illegal street drugs or prescription drugs and try to fix it themselves. Um, I mentioned it, I think, in last week's podcast. The studies say that out of five people with mental illness, Mm -hmm. only two of them seek professional help. Yeah. So that leaves the other ones to be in that category usually of self-medicating. Yeah. And and we in with my group that I see is self-medicating is another word for numbing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's not drugs or alcohol or vaping or some of those things that kind of numb it. Some of it because I work with a lot of women and a lot of these women that are what they would label themselves as, you know, good Christian women, they numb with um, food or they numb with Candy Crush or, um, you know, games on their phone or um, caffeine, just things like that. Anything that changes their physiology really fast to, so that they don't have to feel whatever it is that yeah. they don't want to feel. Yeah. Wow. And, and so with children, you talk about your kids. Um, yeah. Have you seen an increase over those 10 years of kids that suffer with anxiety? Because I feel like we're seeing an increase, but I'm not sure. Yeah, definitely. Everywhere. It doesn't matter. Child, teenager, male, female, and especially living in a COVID world right now. Everybody's Everybody's got a little (laughs) bit, right? But yeah, it's, I think some of it is that we're talking about it more and teens are being able to, like I said, when I was a kid, I didn't know to call it anxiety. I just knew I didn't want to do things. I just wanted to stay back in the shadows. But now we, they, kids know those words. They're mm-hmm. hearing about them more. Thank goodness. Yeah. But because of that, then they're able to, yeah, we, I think we see a lot more kids saying, yeah, I've got anxiety. I've got a problem. Yeah. I need some help. Yeah. Seems like we're seeing just a ton. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think there has always been people that have struggled with it, but it just seems over the top it's in the last right few years anyway. So Yeah, it's a lot. What do you think is causing that? Um, Well, (laughs) there's a lot of different opinions and theories out there, and they're probably all part right. (laughs) Who knows exactly? But um, I think one big contributing factor is that, um, at least with the people I've worked with, is they're not outside working in their yards. They're not outside. The kids aren't outside playing as much. They're not getting as much exercise always as much. Things that just are good for our bodies. Mm-hmm. We eat more fast food. We eat more chemicals and processed things. We um, sit a lot more. And I think um, just good health is a really big factor in 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 keeping ourselves anxiety free. Um, I say all the time, motion creates emotion. You've got to be up and moving and doing something if you want to change your, the emotion you're feeling. So, um, when kids and just even my own son, who's on video games way more than he should, he doesn't get anxiety, but kids who are, um, you know, on their devices, not connecting with other kids. And then they have to go out and go to school and all of a sudden connect and have conversations and look a teacher in the eye or, you know, try to apply for a job. It's really hard. There's a lot of anxiety if they're not out in the community and doing things. And if they're more isolated. And I was going to say, when I was a kid, I was always outdoors. Yeah. You know, I lived along the Provo river and, in in Orem and down in the river bottom. So there was why go inside? There was so much to do outside. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't come in until it was dinner. And then yeah. I'd go back out until it was, you know, adult dark. You yeah. know, when the adults yeah. thought it was dark, it wasn't dark. But <laughs> but I would come in and we didn't have the devices and we didn't, didn't have any of those things. But uh, you see, I mean, all you have to do is visit my house and you'll see, you know, when my kids come over and stuff there. Everybody's sitting on a couch, they're doing their deal and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And it's, that would probably be a a good reason for it, you know, not being out and doing the things like you said. Yeah. And it's the common theme anymore. It is. You walk into a room, even all the adults are (laughs) sitting there scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Yeah. I've got an 85 year old mother and she's on her iPad playing video games all the time. (laughs) Good for her. I don't know that she's, she's any good. It. No, but. she's earned it. 
<laughs> She's earned it. Yeah. Mm, that's awesome. <laughs> and so what, what other theories are there? Is... Well, there's a lot of things like, um, of course, medications, hormones. I mean, there's lots of different things that can contribute to um, anxiety, obviously, of uh, women's bodies. You know, they are constantly changing, not only every month, but when they have children after um, different we use different strategies and different tools. If it's someone who's obviously just had a baby and is going through postpartum anxiety or postpartum depression, we would yeah. certainly never just say something like, um, just be happy, get up and move your body, like, <laughs> you know, eat better. <laughs> we don't say that to the, you know, in that situation. So there's lots of different reasons we can have anxiety. And of course we're going to, those are going to be different on how we treat those people and help those people too. So it's, it's kind of a complex issue. Yeah. Um, also because every person has their own unique anxiety signature pattern. We all do anxiety a little bit different. Some of us might have common symptoms like, um, you know, butterflies in our stomach or heart racing or our breathing changes. It might get more shallow or it might get qu um, quick, but we're going to all do them in a different order and in a different intensity. So it's really complicated to figure out for some people what's going on and, and even be diagnosed with anxiety. If you um, are complaining about, uh, or a kid especially, complaining about stomach pains, we yeah. take them to the doctor and the doctor doesn't, number one, always go to anxiety. They might go to, what's he eating? Is there allergies? Is there, you know, <laughs> all these different things. So even just... Um, with a doctor's help, it can be really confusing. It can take a while to try to figure out your patterns and, and what's going on, but it's a tough, it's a complex, complex issue. Well, and you know what, and one thing that came to mind while you were talking was, uh, kids communicate different. And so you get boys and girls. Mm -hmm. I've got a daughter that's, she's engaged and she still texts him back and forth. And I'm, so you have less talking back and forth and these quick answers, which you can't tell emotion from a, right. you know, unless there's a really good little, uh, emoji, emoji. or something, but, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but, but in all honesty, I think there's probably a little bit of anxiety on, on how to interact with people because there's so, yeah. so much less of it now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kids really struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to school has been going to be tough for some of these kids who've been out for a long time and then don't have great communication skills and they've been on their devices. So, yeah, it's That's tough. That's true. That's yeah, true. I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, and, uh, you know, to kind of go into uh, that question from Cammie, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? I have no idea because... <laughs> But when she asked it, I, I thought, I can see that because, you know, in my own home, I can look at my wife and say, you know, she's constantly doing for everybody. Yeah. And she comes last because that's mm -hmm. just who she is. And so I can see that there would be a heavy burden on on the shoulders of the women that are just trying to do everything for yeah. everybody and be perfect. And, you know, we have that in Utah where where people have a problem with perfectionism. They want to be you know, the ultimate. Yeah, definitely here in Utah. We have one of the highest rates for plastic surgery for women and also for um, uh, medications to mm -hmm. help with moods and, and yeah. different antidepressants and things like that. So one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand, women, I think, know this in their heart, but they don't always recognize it. And I don't know if guys always get it. So it's good. It's a good we don't less get a lot. <laughs> Guys, don't get it at all. No, I'm just kidding. But women are designed, it's part of their DNA to always be seeking things that are beautiful. We like to feel beautiful. We like to be in beautiful spaces. We like beautiful food. We like our children to be beautiful, act well, dress well. You know, we, we want our homes to be beautiful. And what happens is because we, and beauty for each woman, of course, is a different, different definition, but we yeah. like pretty beautiful things. We like things to be, um, right and proper. Usually thing. And what happens with that, and what we were just saying a minute ago with like the social media, we get online and we look at every other woman being what looks like perfect. Mm -hmm. And then we look around our living room and our children who are throwing things and left messes all over and, you know, and we put on a little extra weight and, you know, all those things. And all of a sudden 
our anxiety alarm goes off. And then just like your wife, we've got women with huge hearts who want to serve, to love, to give, to care. And all of a sudden, these women who are running on empty already, trying to take care of their families. Many moms work and, and are moms. Some of these women now are homeschooling too. It's just a lot. We juggle so many balls at one time. And we get sometimes to a point where we have so many balls being juggled up in the air and we know they're going to drop. We know one of them at least is going to drop. And then it's not going to be beautiful. We're going to be a mess. And that's a hard place for a woman to be in, in that moment where you can feel it coming. It's not pretty. And in that moment, ideally, it would be really great if we would say to somebody, I need some help. I'm juggling too many things. I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. I'm suicidal. Anything. Mm -hmm. But if we do that... Now we've got another problem. We're in a trap. Because our divine being, our divine nature at core is to be beautiful, create beauty, help all these people, because that's beautiful. But if I drop all these balls and people see my mess, now I have shame. (laughs) Now I have guilt and embarrassment. And that's a bigger mess, and I don't want my people to see that one thing to see them have them see me drop a ball or two but if I drop them all I can't do that a lot of women won't do it fear the judgment of others and and that they're letting people down what if my release society president neighbor or what if my mother-in-law or what if my coworkers find out that this facade that I've been putting on for all these people is just a facade? And we want to be good enough. We want to be put out our best, most beautiful self. But behind the makeup and the, the hair color and the, and the fancy clothes or the car is a little girl inside of a body who's just really scared that somebody's going to notice that she might not be good enough. One of the things I teach is that we, we have two real fears. There's only two real fears in the whole world. The phobias are separate. There's two real emotional fears. And the first one is... Um, I'm not good enough. And the second one is, if I'm not good enough, I won't be loved. So we have all these women trying so hard who just want people to tell them they're good enough and they want unconditional love. The the next trap, though, is for the women is that as they strive to be enough, They forget who they really are, and they forget that they were enough already. It's not about how they look or their home or if their kids are being stinkers. It's they were already enough. They just forgot to listen to that inner voice, and they listened to the world's voice. And that's so hard when we're back to, like, being on social media all the time. Because mm-hmm. we're looking at other people's edited pictures, best. edited best, yeah. their facades that they're putting out. And they all are. All of them are. I mean, I don't see people posting their kids' toys all over the floor. And, Not usually. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that they just had a fight with their husband and, yeah. you know. Yeah. But yet they all have been there. They've all. Absolutely. You know. And, and you know, and it's... It, it, like you said, the edited. I mean, it's it goes down to even the pictures that we take where we, you know, might fix a blemish or fix, you know, this and that and with Photoshop and things. And mm-hmm. so we're living up to kind of unreal expectations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's a tough place to live 24-7 yeah. in the world of other people's expectations and measuring yourself on their measuring stick. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's a tough place to be. It's It opens up that door for the minute you get, like I said a minute ago, the minute you start to get overwhelmed, stressed, you feel like you can't juggle anymore, that's where that anxiety alarm gets triggered. And depression is anxiety's best buddy. They often come together. And that's, that's hard. It's a hard spot to be. So let me ask, ask this. So I think it was the episode I, I featured my wife on one of the episodes. Oh, yeah. And we talked about uh, the adverse childhood experiences. Mm-hmm. So you said the two um, fears, yeah. the two biggest fears yeah. were that not you're being good not enough. enough and that you won't be loved if you're yeah, not en- yeah, if you're not enough, you won't be loved. Do you think that that goes back to things you heard as a child? Mm. Do you think it? Yeah. Because I know so many times, you know, what happens to you as a child really follows you the rest of your life. Definitely. And for each person, those experiences could be totally different. But I think we're inherently people pleasers. We want to. Yeah. We want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We want to make people happy. Mm -hmm. And as kids, we're not able to fully understand things that are said. And so I think a lot of it's left to interpretation Mm -hmm. to children because they don't understand the words, the, you know, and, and that can follow you and haunt you your entire life, especially if you have had some adverse childhood experiences that kind of make you feel a not enough Mm. or, um, situations where you felt like your love was based upon condition. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, you're right on. I think we also have, if you go back just a generation or two, not too many years, a lot of people I work with, they they were told not to feel emotions. Mm-hmm. Be quiet, sit down, talk when you're spoken to, things like that. So they didn't get a chance to even label the emotion that they were feeling or process it. So we have all these adults going around right now who've stuffed all of these things. And some of them, like you said, probably aren't always a big deal. It's not that we have to have these big, horrible, traumatic things, Mm -hmm. but they are traumatic. Little things can be big when we're little kids. And then all of a sudden we've got this energy that we've pushed down we hold on to it and it affects us. Yeah. For years and years. And some of it is just because we didn't know what to call it and we didn't know what to do with it. I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Makes you think. Makes me think anyway. Yeah. I'm going, yeah. I hadn't really thought of any of those things. You know, men, I think men look at social media different than women. Um, if I see somebody that has taken some incredible trip or see this you know, beautiful house and things like that. I, as a man, I kind of look at it and go, oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know, <laughs> wow, nice. that'd be cool to go there, you know, <laughs> yeah. and uh, see a beautiful house. I'll think, man, they must be doing well and, and stuff. But I, I guess I don't look at it as a direct comparison of, of, to base my worth off of somebody else's success. I mean, yeah, you know, I, but I do see that because we do compare ourselves I think it's a, a natural human thing to do is to, you know, want to be better. Better. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think too, um, I know we are living in a world right now where we have more women than ever before in the history of the earth who are owning their own businesses mm-hmm. because of technology, because they can work at home and still have kids and a family. Yeah. But prior to that, you know, generally speaking, men, get a paycheck. They go to work and they get a paycheck. And that's a lot of that is how they were validated for doing a good job and being a good person and being enough. They're bringing home a paycheck and they're providing. Um, but women didn't, all, not all women have that. And some of these stay at home moms, especially when they're sitting home and they're alone and they've got kids that are giving them headaches they get on social media to zone out, to numb the pain, numb the frustration. And then, yeah, you start going, oh my goodness, I'm struggling. I'm not happy. And my neighbor just went on it. Yeah, a big, 
vacation or they remodeled or whatever. And we do, we measure our self-worth and our, um, we get validated by, no, we don't get validated. We're, we, we measure, we're just too busy measuring and comparing. And whenever you get caught up in that comparison mode, that is a scary place to be because comparison steals joy. And, and if you're already overwhelmed and struggling and you're scrolling, 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 and it's zap, you know, zapping the happiness and, and stealing your joy, that's not a good place to be. And then we're back in that trap. How do I create, a, be beautiful and create a beautiful space and a beautiful life, but I'm here all by myself in a mess? Well, I think it, when you go back to the men are out making a paycheck, and if you've got a a woman that's a housewife and she's keeping the house up and she's making sure the meals are cooked and taking care of the kids. Her paycheck is being recognized for what she's doing. Yeah. And as guys, we're a little bit, we're a little slow. <laughs> we're a little slow. I'll take the heat. I, I could totally see that, you know, yeah. that, that are we recognizing that the laundry is done? Are we recognizing yeah. that, you know, the house is clean and, the kids are dressed and, and we go to work and want to come home and just relax. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and women don't get, if the husband doesn't say anything, they don't get a lot of validation or recognition. They don't get a, a you know, a, an achievement award for getting the laundry done every day this month or, and no child runs in and says, mom, great job cleaning the toilet today. Yeah. You know, it's just, they just don't get it. And that, no. that makes it hard when you're trying to juggle a lot. My kids thought they grew up in a bed and breakfast. They were waiting for the little mint on the pillow. How <laughs> Their would clothes that be? laid out like it was going on a mannequin. And so, no, I, I totally, I totally get that. You know, and it makes me stop and think because, it, I think we get caught up in ourselves yeah. and what we're doing, and and so we need to be more aware of, yeah, of the needs of of. Everybody likes to be recognized. We need it. Everybody likes to be wanted, accepted, noticed. Yeah. And so for somebody that's in the house and their most adult conversation they're getting is with kids, that's tough. It is tough. If you're overwhelmed and stressed and it's really tough. And for guys, if we were that in the house that long with our kids, we'd probably go to prison. (laughs) So... (laughs) Okay, there's there's good guys out there. I would probably go there's to prison. There's a lot of good dads out there, but even some moms, though. It's it's a hard job. It is. It's a hard job. Yeah. And it's a thankless job. It is a thankless job most of the time. Yeah. And so yeah. what do you recommend to those women when they're trying to numb themselves? Do you tell them to stay off social media? I mean, what what's the answer to that? So I have um, three things I suggest for um, for anybody but especially this type of um, situation. Women who are overwhelmed and stressed and not even putting themselves on the priority list, this is what I suggest for them. So number one, find a friend. Women need women. Women need to talk. Women need to feel each other's emotions. And the hard part is a lot of women would be like, but I have my husband. And we want to be best friends with our husbands. But women still need women. They Mm -hmm. really do. They need a woman. So I encourage people to find a friend. Now, sometimes that's really hard, especially right now. Having a friendship can be really difficult if you can only talk to them on Zoom or over the phone. But it's still something. And you need to find a friend that you feel safe enough to say something like, I'm going to drop all these balls today. I'm really struggling. I'm really overwhelmed. I can't do it anymore. I need help. And it needs to be a friend that when she hears those words, she knows this is real. This is serious. She needs some help. Um, I like to tell people that if you have, if you're struggling and you reach out and you say to somebody, I am struggling or I need some help and they don't react or they say, oh, shake it off. You're fine. Or everybody has a hard day or, you know, they kind of downplay it. Then you need to tell somebody else and you need to tell enough people, tell somebody hears you. Yeah. 
And that's hard when you're overwhelmed and already tired and exhausted, but you've got to do that. You've got to love yourself enough to say, somebody out there cares. Somebody out there is going to hear me. It might be a stranger. It might be someone at church. It might be someone online in a, a Facebook group, or but somebody out there will hear you and somebody out there will help you, but you've got to say something. You've got to find a friend, somebody to say that to you. And that's, that's tough, but that's number one. You've got to find someone to, to voice. And it's got to be the right person because, yeah, because you could reach out to somebody and that person could take what you've said and undermine you and, Absolutely. and, and belittle you for laying it out there. So it's got to be somebody you can trust. Really I, could, trust. I could see that that would be. Yeah. And it's hard because we'd love to have tell like for women who work, it'd be really nice to be able to talk to a coworker or a manager, but it's scary in those positions because you don't want to risk your job. Yeah. Or if it's at church, you don't want to risk your whole church congregation knowing. Or, I mean, it's, it yeah. is. You've got to find a safe person. One of the things I say all the time is if you can't find somebody, if you've really tried and you really can't find somebody, I tell all these ladies, you call me. I'll be your friend. I'm your sister. I'll be, I'm your friend. You can reach out to me. And that's the case here too. Anybody who hears this, if you can't find somebody, you reach out to me. And so how do you tell? I mean, what's, what's the signs? I mean, how, how do you tell if there's, if it's a safe person? Is there some, some things you look for? I mean, how do you know that? That's tough because you have to be vulnerable and you have to be courageous and you have to know you could be getting hurt again. And it takes a lot if you've been hurt before to open up and do that. But some of it is building just a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's just like any other thing. You just have to start building a relationship. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I wish there was like a magic answer, but it's, it's time and, and being open to trusting people and, and just finding good people in your life that will, when you say, Hey, this is a problem, they recognize that. Well, and I guess, I guess part of it, well, and th- tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> <laughs> tell me how, cause I was thinking, I was thinking about that. How, how would you know? And I guess maybe one of the, one of the telltale signs would be to, if you've heard that person gossip, yeah, then you know who they are. Absolutely. And and if you hear someone that puts someone down, then yeah, you know not you've got to you've got to look for somebody that that hasn't shown patterns of that. I guess. Yeah. And in any relationship, an intimate marriage relationship, a, a, a parent child relationship, the two most important things you have. A lot of times, people say, "Well, you just have to have really good love, or you've got to have, you know, good communication skills, or whatever." But at the end of the day, the core values you need are respect and trust. And if you can respect that person, the trust is probably there too. But you wouldn't respect someone who was out gossiping about someone you cared about. So I would look for character traits of respect and trust. Okay. So they got to find a friend. Find a friend is number one. That yeah. they can lay it out there. Yep. They need some support. They need some lifelines. That makes sense. Find a friend. Yeah. The second thing um, um, I call go inside. It's, uh, this strategy is inside out. Number two is inside. Number three is outside. So um, when you have a woman who is so overwhelmed and um, juggling all of those things like we've been talking about, and they really need some help, and they're not getting it, they've got to decide to do something for that little girl that's inside of them. They've got to go inside. The little girl in there needs some nurturing. She needs love. And she hasn't been through yet because she's still stuck in the little girl stage. She hasn't been through all the hurt and the trauma and the betrayal and the anxiety and the fears that, that you've been through. you got to connect with that little girl. She knows how to have fun. And she knows how to be happy. And she knows what it feels like to play. So we need to find little ways to connect to her every day. Now, that doesn't mean some big project because you're already overwhelmed and you've already got a full to-do list. So we're not looking for big things. A lot of women say to me in this moment, when I tell them that, they say, well, I love to scrapbook or I love to, and they share some big hobby that takes six or eight hours. And I'm like, that is so great. Let's see if we can think of something a little smaller. We need to find some things that are, I call them two millimeters in size, teeny tiny, that you can do with success. 
Because if you're planning a big project, you're going to set yourself up for more failure Mm -hmm. and then more guilt and then more shame. And then it's not pretty and it's not beautiful. So find something little that's fun and even silly if possible. Um, I have a client who a long time ago, she was struggling with some things and I asked her what would something, her little girl, what would be fun for her? And all on her own, I didn't suggest this at all, I promise. But she said, I'm going to drive to work every day wearing a tiara. <laughs> and she did. And she does. I saw that lane. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think she stopped. That was a few years ago. But, but she would drive all the way, um, like a 35, 40 minute commute to work wearing a tiara. It, it doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of money. Um, and um, well, maybe it was a diamond. And cr- maybe it was a lot of money. I don't know. But, she stopped at Tiffany's. That's right. <laughs> but, but it's something that helped her connect with that little girl that was just for her. It was just one minute of placing that on her head that made her feel special and young and it put her on the priority list. So we're looking for little tiny things that we can do something every day to connect inside with that little spirit, that little girl that's inside of us. Make her feel loved and know, help her know that she's enough. So we, she doesn't have to have those two fears. She is enough. She always was enough. And she will be loved. And I was going to say, I think as children, as kids, we're so excited about being adults that we, we waste too much time not enjoying being kids. And then next thing you know, we're adults and we're wishing we could be kids. Exactly. Adulting sucks. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's not fun. And so, yeah, you know, and you think about the things you did as a kid and, and life just got serious. Yeah. Yeah. What a bummer. Way bummer. (laughs) Way bummer. One of the things that I love to do, and it takes just a couple minutes more than two minutes, but I live really close to a park. And one of the things I noticed a few years ago was when I'm feeling overwhelmed and all that craziness or anxious, I would find myself swinging on the swing set at the park. And I didn't realize until I started going back through some pictures a couple of years ago, I have a whole history of swing sets hanging from rope swings from trees and swing sets. And for some reason, my little girl inside of me feels really free on a swing set. And so I embrace that now. When I'm really struggling, you'll find me at the park on a swing set. There you go. And it, it doesn't take a lot of time, like I said, because I live really close to a park. It just a few minutes on a swing set, though, reshifts my whole mental state, my mindset, it helps me connect with that little inside part, but it helps just me get grounded again. And it puts me on the priority plate. I have to stop everything. I can't be on my phone swinging on the swing set. So it makes me set everything aside and get back inside to me and loving me and helping me make sure I remember that actually I'm enough and I always was. Wait, cool. Yeah. So find something. Number two is find something little and tiny that you can do every day that, or and have several little things, but that you can pick up and do successfully every day just to get inside and connect with that little girl. I like that. Yeah, super simple. The third thing is the outside part. It's really important for us to get outside of ourselves. Whenever we get, um, especially these women who are home all day by themselves, whether they're working online or with kids or both, um, we need to get outside of ourselves and think about or help someone else. Do something for a cause, do something for a charity, do something for an organization, anything that gets us to stop for just a minute thinking about all of our problems and help do something good for somebody else or something in the world that's good. And we all know when we do service for other people, it, we do it for the other person, but we feel so good inside when we do it. We need to get outside of ourselves and just do a tiny little random act of kindness or anything. It doesn't have to be big. Tiny things work best, but um, we need to get outside of ourselves. And because as we fill ourselves up, when we're taking care of ourselves, then it's our turn to be a light and help somebody else who kind needs like the that. light. Kind of like the oxygen mask, right? A hundred percent. hundred percent. Yep. Put your own on and then go help somebody else. And, and again, don't make it big and hard and complicated. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take a lot to just make somebody laugh or, you know, 
snuggle and play with your puppy or take it for a walk. I mean, it can be little things, but we need to get outside of ourself and outside of our head that's overthinking and overwhelmed. And I think, at least for me, maybe it's just guys, but I have a hard time focusing on more than one thing. So Mm -hmm. when you, when you do shift that focus to something else, that becomes the priority and I can't. Yeah. I'm not a good multitasker, so I'm a one and done. I've got to be doing (laughs) what I'm doing. And And that's really important to point out because guys' brains work different than women's brains. A guy does do one thing at a time. They get on I-15 and they're like, I get on here, I drive down, I get off. That's it. It's like (laughs) A to B. That's my task. Go. But a woman's brain, if you're in Utah listening to this, we have something we call the spaghetti bowl on I-15, right? (laughs) It's where two freeways like intersect and it's a crazy, crazy exchange of roads. And that's how a woman's brain works. Every detail connects to everything. We don't turn off one box. We just open up 12 others and every box connects to each other. And so it is overwhelming. Guys do have an option of when a guy says, I'm not thinking about anything. Sometimes that's really true. (laughs) Right. And a woman goes, that's not even possible because I'm thinking about work, which makes me think about my husband, which makes me think about my kids, which makes me think about my neighbors, which makes me then remember I have to do dinner and grocery shop. It it is all one. I can't admit or deny. It's a lot. (laughs) So, uh, that's mm-hmm. you know, and that's that's true. I, uh, yeah, As, uh, women are smarter. <laughs> I didn't say smarter. I just said <laughs> our brains think about a lot at once, and it's, it's get, it gets exhausting. And and for me to try to do two things at once, if I'm driving and thinking of something else, I'm going to miss my exit yeah, because I literally am it. dialed in to just <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah. mm-hmm. I'm feeling really bad about my no. I'm, <laughs> no nobody I'm should feel bad about I'm anything. <laughs> So then do something for somebody else. And then what do you see? What, what are the, what's the payback then that you see in people? Cause you're meeting with people that are, are taking these three steps. Can you, can you see a difference? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, as you're asking, asking that question, I'm thinking of dozens and dozens of stories. I'm trying to even just pick one, but yeah, there is a big payback when we as women decide, and and that's probably the magic word here is we have to decide, we have to want to believe it. And even if we don't believe it yet, we have to decide that actually we're okay just the way we are. (laughs) And if we decide we're good enough, and believe it, and we make ourselves a little bit of a priority, yeah, the paybacks are huge. It's a life of peace. It's a life of freedom. It's a life of being able to forgive yourself for holding on to all that stuff and letting it go. Um, I had a woman um, who was a very big corporate woman that I was working with. She was one of my clients a few years ago and she used a lot of masculine energy in her, in her, um, career because not only was she a manager over hundreds and hundreds of people in several States, but they worked in the prison system. So she was in and out of prison. So she was pretty masculine energy driven. Mm -hmm. We started working together because of a personal issue, had nothing to do with her work. And her boss called her in a few weeks later and said, something's changed with you. You're still super driven. You're my top person, but something about you's changed. And he said, I don't know what it is, but something's different and we all are noticing it. And he started explaining some of the coworkers, um, comments to her about how they notice she's easier to work with. She's happier. She's just softer, but still really driven. And he said, I don't know what it is, but keep it up. And because you of this, I'm going to give you a $7,000 raise. Wow. Now, $7,000 raise would be really great mm-hmm. for everybody. I would love everybody to get a $7,000 raise, but people liking you more, people wanting to connect with you more, just feeling happier and calmer in your spirit, um, able to accomplish more, still be driven, but do it without being so tight and tense and stressed all the time. That's a pretty good payback. I was going to say. Yeah. 7,000 is just a bonus. 7,000 is a nice (laughs) bonus. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Well, and... 
the anxiety level will drop Mm -hmm. when you start to really focus on those three things. And definitely. And so this is a daily thing or is this, you know, you want to be able to take that moment daily, like the lady wearing the tiara. Yeah. Tiara. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, if you can find no if you can find something that's just little to do every day that's you do it to be loving to you. Yeah. That's it. You're doing something kind and loving for you. And yeah, we don't always have two hours to go hobby or manicure or pedicures or <laughs> go to the spa or whatever. Those days are bonuses. You've got to embrace and find the little things that are good for you. They um, have done studies that show if you can, if you like to read, if you will like really sit down and actually read a really good book that you like, that drops your anxiety level drastically. Really? Laughing fake laughing or real laughing. You can honestly do a fake silly laugh that feels totally ridiculous, but it releases those feel good hormones and chemicals in your body. It doesn't matter real or fake. Your brain can't tell. So you can, if you can find things to laugh at a comedian or jokes or whatever you can find, you can turn that on every day for just two or three minutes and laugh you automatically can release feel-good chemicals in your body that are going to help reduce the depression, reduce the anxiety. That's pretty cool, too. So I'm hoping my wife's listening. (laughs) She's been married to me for 26 years. Oh, awesome. And she used to laugh at my jokes. (laughs) I think she's heard all of them. So, honey, if you're listening to this, fake laugh. Fake laugh. (laughs) for her to fake laugh. It's good for your ego. It's good for her emotions. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I need it. I yeah. Need so it. there's lots of small little things you can do though, but you just got to find something that makes you happy and then yeah, do it every day. Some of these women also say, oh, I just don't have any confidence. I just, mm-hmm. I don't feel good about myself. I'm not confident enough, but the recipe for confidence is doing something uh, repeatedly. That's a tiny little action again and again and again. That's mm-hmm. confidence. Doing something successfully again and again. Kind of like practice. Practice. So if you can get up and every day do something like put a tiara on or laugh at some jokes or some people, it's just something as silly as make your bed. When you get up and you make your bed, if you're not a bed maker normally, Mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you've done something successfully every morning, but it also gives you a safe place to fall at the end of the day. And that was my favorite book. (laughs) <laughs> by, uh, uh, make my bed. Make my have by, not read uh, that one. Admiral William McRaven, oh, and it, yeah. you know that's what he says. Hey, if if you can only do one thing, make your bed. Make your bed, and at least then your day started with one thing that you knew you could accomplish. Yeah, you started with a win. And, you're growing your confidence, and at the end of the day, if you've had an anxiety f- day, you know with a hundred percent certainty. And that's the opposite of, you know, yeah. helping close that gap for anxiety. You know with certainty, you have a safe place to go to, a beautiful place to fall at the end of your day. Yeah. And one thing that you said, and, and uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but you do these things and you gain confidence. Yeah. And you know how you would mentioned that people were noticing her at the workplace, right? Yes, yes. I think confidence is an attractive thing. So if, if you see somebody that's confident, you're automatically attracted to that, per, you know, because they are confident They're not cocky. They're just confident. Yeah. And so I think that's one of those things that somebody could pick up on yeah. without a word being said, just the confidence level, because, and, and I don't know if that goes that way for women to men, but from men to women, a woman that's confident, you find that attractive. Yeah, absolutely. There's just exactly right. There's been lots of studies and women think, well, I have to have a beautiful, perfect body to be my, to have my husband or a partner be attracted to me. And they've actually discovered that no men are actually more attracted to their confidence and their certainty. I think that's by for sure. Far. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause as guys, I mean, <laughs> Bodies change. Bodies change. Yeah, we, bodies we, we get change. The bad body. Yeah, <laughs> bodies change. You can't just be caught up on just the body. No. Yeah. And and like I said, I think that's something you'd pick up without a word being said. Yeah. Just from you know 
the way you hold yourself. Absolutely. A confident person does not sit with their shoulders forward and their chin down that, uh, you know, t- closed up arms and the legs tight together. That's a sign of someone who's ang- somebody who's anxious, who's afraid, mm-hmm. who's scared. If all we did is just pick up our chin, Just that motion, if you put your um, finger under your chin and just lift it up, you can feel your diaphragm opening up, you can feel your shoulders go back, and your brain goes, oh wait, hold on, we're doing something different here, (laughs) And, and, and it feels a lot better. So yeah, confidence is very noticeable, and it's very attractive quality. Now for women in the workplace that they're gone eight hours a day, yeah, and they still have kids, and, and, and I think that's something that's changed from when I was a kid. You know, when I was a kid, there was less women working. Yeah. They were home to take care of the kids. Uh, husbands were the breadwinners. And life has changed on the planet. And you have um, women that were forced to go into the workplace because of a divorce. You have... Uh, they're keeping up with the Joneses. Everybody wants to have the nicest, and so it requires two incomes. And so we have a lot more women that are, are out there making it happen. And so that's got to add a lot of stress because now they're really kind of doing two jobs. They've got their eight-hour day at work, and then they're coming home probably still feeling expected to handle the laundry, the food, the kids. How, what do you say to those women? It's a lot. Um, I say... You're amazing, first of all. <laughs> but the next thing is, um, one of the strategies that I work uh, that I've used with some of these women is to find a way to kind of take those self care moments in the car driving home, mm-hmm. to make that space there come down from work, let go of all the work stuff, and relax for a few minutes, and then mentally and emotionally prepare themselves for coming home and starting their next full-time job. And sometimes that includes things like music or fragrances, or I have a lotion strategy that helps reduce anxiety. They just, you know, put lotion on for a few minutes because whenever you're doing something that's self-care, that's loving for yourself, you're pushing away fear because love and fear don't occupy the same space at the same time. So we try to find loving things that they can do to kind of transition, uh, making the separating the one job from the other job. Because if they walk in stressed and overwhelmed, they're not a good mama or a good wife. They're not. They're just stressed out and angry and and hurting inside. They're suffering. So we try to do things to fill them up, get them recharged. But they still need to find some little things throughout the day that are for themselves, that self-care. They And I'm not saying that just be kind to yourself and everything magically is going to get better. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying this is the first step. Step. It's just one of the puzzle pieces. It's where we start and then we build from there. So find, I need, still want them to find some little things that can make their day fun, that help them connect with that inner child, that help them be happy and silly and um, just playful even so that they can to, just to help balance the scale a little bit more. And I think as like we talked about with kids, spending all that time you know, thinking about being an adult and wanting yeah. to be an adult. It, it seems fun to actually spend some time as an adult mm-hmm. trying to do the opposite, you yeah. know, because, you know, and I don't know if it, it goes back to the grass is greener somewhere else, but, but that is fun. There's so many things that I enjoyed doing as a kid and I don't do any of them. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. And a, and a good resource for us is to look to our kids. Mm-hmm. If we've forgotten how to be a kid, look to our children. They're really good at playing. They are really good at grounding us in those silly little fun things that moms often say no to. And so a good tip for any parent is to say yes, to take a day and just be like, whatever my kid asked today, that's like something that's not my, you know, that's not in my world of ad- adulting today. Mm-hmm. Say yes, pause your day for a few minutes, roll around on the floor, have a Nerf gun war, go for a walk, go play at the pl- park, whatever. It's, it's, you know, good for them and good for you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Just need to play sometimes. And so that explains the women aspect of it. Mm-hmm. 
but for kids that are are suffering, what do you what do you suggest for kids? Yeah, kids are a little trickier because, like you, you mentioned earlier, kids don't speak to us always in a way. They don't come up to us and say, I'm feeling anxious today. (laughs) I'm really anxious. I have a spelling test today. (laughs) They don't say that. So we have to learn as parents to learn our child's that unique anxiety signature pattern that I was talking about earlier. Parents know their kids better than anybody else. And they have to learn the body language, their kid's body language. Um, They have to learn what their child's words actually mean. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to those things, But kids, we teach them, one, some simple steps to how to turn off their anxiety alarm um, in the moment, which is really cool and really easy to do. Um, We teach them strategies they can use when they're not around mom and dad and they're not home if they're at school or with their friends that they can do um, to help lessen the anxiety and to keep that anxiety alarm from ringing. But talking to them is really a really great start. I think the thing that most kids need to know is you're just having a feeling. You Mm. don't have anxiety. That's another mistake is sometimes we label our kids really young. You have depression, you have anxiety. We don't want to label them that early on because now all of a sudden the kid's like, well, now I have this huge problem and I don't know how to take it off. I don't know what to do. And, and I'm not good enough now. Or, you know, Mm. they create these stories in their heads about these labels that they've just been given. So we just want to say to them, you're feeling anxiety. Where does that feel? Where are you feeling it in your body? Help them to see, be like, oh, when I feel this in my body, which could be different than my brother or sister, which is normal, that's just my body telling me I'm worried about something. Yeah. And anxiety is a really cool gift because anxiety only shows up to protect us. Anxiety is always, always about protection. So if your brain feels like you're getting ready to feel something that doesn't feel good, some kind of suffering, embarrassment, criticism, not good enough, not worthy enough, whatever it is, your anxiety alarm goes off. So if you teach kids, hey, guess what? Your anxiety alarm just went off. That's so great. Your brain is protecting you. It just wants you to be happy and it wants you to be safe. Where are you feeling that emotion? What does it feel like? What is? What do you think? Not the parent telling them, letting the kids say, what do you think that your brain wants to keep you safe from, doesn't want you to feel? And and we, it's the same strategy with adults. And I can say to a woman, well, what is, what is your brain trying to protect you from right now? And in an instant, every time they go, criticism, failure, not being good enough, judged, And it's the same with kids. They just don't know how to label it. But if we start teaching them that, oh, you're just having that feeling, a feeling's not a problem. That's okay. Everybody has feelings. Yeah. And it changes that whole mindset of something's wrong with me to this is a gift. This is normal. It's a gift. Your your brain and body are working exactly how they're supposed to to keep you safe. never even thought of that. Yeah. Kind of like the same thing that if you're actually physically hurt, doesn't it release some endorphins to block the pain? Absolutely. And, yeah. Huh. I compare it oftentimes to like a smoke detector in a huh. home. Smoke detector, the, it only it goes off. It only The alarm only goes off if it's trying to warn you of danger. And mm-hmm. in this case, it's physical danger. But your anxiety alarm only goes off when it's trying to protect you from emotional suffering or danger. And so rec- recognizing those things that bring that on, that feeling on, yep. can can teach you a lot about how to, you know, Absolute. break it down too. Absolutely. That is why learning your child's and your own too, but if you're a parent, learning those physical symptoms that show up in your body are so important. Because like I said, we all have our own pattern. We all do it a little different. But if you can start to recognize, oh my goodness, that first physical symptom just showed up. Mm -hmm. That's my anxiety alarm. Now, if I take care of it right now, validate it, talk to it, figure out what's going on, it's going to stop. If I don't because I haven't learned that yet. Smoke detector is just going to keep beeping. It keeps going. And even though a smoke detector doesn't actually get louder, but boy, does it sound louder, right? Especially if it's the one that the battery goes yeah, out in the middle of the night. you can't figure out which one it is either. <laughs> 
But that's the same with your body. That alarm is going to get louder. The, st- the, the butterflies in your stomach are going to turn to pains. You know, your, your little flutter in your chest is going to turn into a lot of pressure and tension. So you've got to just pay attention to what your body's telling you. If you can catch it early, you can avoid a lot of that. And everybody's body's suffering. different. So that's, yeah. And you know, and, and, and dealing with kids, wouldn't it be nice if they all, all of your kids were the same? But oh no, yeah, that would be Your awesome. kids are like <laughs> totally different. I've got four kids and, and they're totally different. And yeah. each one. You got to have your own bag of tricks for each one of them. Yep. So that's... That's why it's important that they learn their pattern. Yeah. And how how early should you have those discussions? I think you can start like... I mean, I don't know that there's a magic age because like you said, every kid's different. But I think you can start talking about that when they're like three. Yeah. And just do it on their level. Yeah, on their level. Absolutely. Are you feeling sad? Yes. Okay, well, good. They're learning that when they're tears in their eyes that that means they feel sad it's okay we're just having an emotion that's okay you can sit here and feel sad for a minute that's okay I like that yeah and so do you and again I'm asking things because I don't know (laughs) anxiety does that tend to go away at a certain age or do we see even our senior community have anxiety so I think um I think well, the way I teach it <laughs> is you don't want anxiety to go away because uh-huh. it's a gift. Yeah. You don't want it to go away. And that's when you all of a sudden can be like, oh my goodness, this was something I thought I had to battle my mm-hmm. whole life. This was punishment from God or you know something like that. What's wrong with me? That's a huge thing to overcome. But if we can start embracing that anxiety is a gift, and that we don't want it to go away. We just want to u- learn how to use it in an empowering way instead of letting it keep us stuck. And when we get stuck and we get caught up in those shadows and we're missing out on our own life, that's when it's really easy to spiral down depression, even suicidal thoughts or tendencies. We don't want to go there. So we learn that pattern so we can stop it and embrace the gift in that moment. And then we add strategies custom tweaked for each person and their situation so that when that they address that alarm, they know exactly what to do for their body and their situation and it goes away in the moment. And the more we do that, the less the anxiety alarm gets triggered. So they're not doing it as often. But if it does come up that their alarm goes off again, it's okay because they'll know exactly what to do and they'll know it's a gift in the moment. Their body's just there to protect them. And that's a good thing. And I see so many things that just kind of fit from what you're saying to things that we deal with in prevention to things that you deal with mental illness. A lot of it is very similar. Yes. Just laid out differently. So that's that's really cool. Yeah. I've never actually had a discussion about anxiety. (laughs) It's kind of fun. (laughs) I wasn't anxious once the whole time. Perfect. (laughs) That's a good thing. (laughs) So do, you, so do you typically coach women or do you coach men as well? I do coach men as well. I usually get more women just uh-huh. because women are emotional creatures. And men think don't like always want to open up and talk about it. And the what good thing is, <laughs> I know. <laughs> the good thing is a lot of work that we do with anxiety, you don't have to open up and spill your whole life story. Mm-hmm. Most of the strategies and things that I, I don't have to even know what's going on in their lives. So it works really good for men mm-hmm. um, and teenagers too, because teenagers don't always want to open up either. Yeah. But yeah, I get a lot more men, but I work with a lot of um, business owners and managers in companies because they've got maybe an employee who has anxiety and they don't know how to help them or relate to them. Um, so no, I work with all different kinds of situations and people and of all ages and yeah. Now what about OCD? Oh, that's a tricky one. Does that one kind of follow similar patterns to anxiety or? I personally believe, um, and I will be honest, I am not an OCD expert. So if Uh you get an OCD expert on here, they'll probably know better than me, but the women and that I've worked with who've had OCD, Mm -hmm. I have never worked with a man who has it, but I've worked with women and it is 
from the way we look at it, it is part of their anxiety pattern. It's that that alarm has gone off and they're looking for ways. When that alarm goes off, something's so uncertain. And so remember, we were talking earlier about we need certainty Mm -hmm. to balance the scale. And so that's when they kind of go into those OCD patterns, they have something that they can control with 100% certainty. And when we teach them where to get certainty in the right places and we bring down that anxiety so that they don't have to be like controlling something so strongly, a lot of times that OCD um, settles right down. Because I always thought the two were kind of connected. Yeah, I think they definitely are. And uh, I'm not going to say anything on air, but (laughs) I may may. may or may May not not have a really... (laughs) weird thing about getting in the shower in the morning and I have to make sure that the shampoo and the conditioner bottles are mm-hmm. aligned. Yeah, because what would happen if they're not? I don't know. Yeah. I've never known because yeah. they're fixed every time Every time I get in there. You should try it and see what happens. <laughs> I shouldn't admit anything. I'm not opening up about That's that. That's right. But, uh, Take the fifth. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and coming. So if somebody has liked what they've heard on this program tonight, And they think that maybe the coaching is is the answer. I've learned a ton tonight. Oh, good. And so how how best can somebody reach out to you and know what you've got available? The easiest way to find me is honestly social media. I'm all over the place. Just look for my name, Rachel Curfew, on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Um, my personal um, email is just Rachel Curfew at Gmail. Super simple. I'm really easy to find. Perfect. And that, I guess the cool thing about coaching is it, even before COVID, were you doing a lot of it just via Zoom? I actually ha- uh, moved my business online several years ago. Okay. I, on occasion, will do some live things, uh, events, or when I'm working with companies or different things like that. But for the most part, yeah, it's it's all it's always been online, so it's really easy. So. And so you you will do things for the corporate world and, and come in and do things. Is there a benefit to that? I mean, do they see better protect? productivity and things after your coaching? Absolutely. So imagine you're um, a a boss of a company, an owner of a company, and you have an employee who is showing up every day and you know something's going on because they were one of your top producers and all of a sudden they're just not in the game. Yeah. You just, you don't know what's going on. And as sometimes as the boss, it's not always appropriate or they don't feel comfortable walking up to the person and saying, what's going on in your personal life? Cause something's not right. Mm-hmm. And you're bringing it to work. So what's really cool about that is I get to go in and either work with the, the owner or manager, or I get to work with the employee. It just depends on the situation. Mm-hmm. If I can take an employee who is coming to work with personal distractions and they're only showing up giving maybe 30 for, or 40% yeah. Instead of 90 or 100%. And collecting 100% of the As pay. That's what I was going to say. That hurts the, the business. It, does. it hurts the owner. It hurts the business. So when we come in and as an owner, um, if they're willing to provide coaching services and I come in and I get to work with that employee that's struggling and we resolve or heal or create a system or you know whatever that person needs um, around whatever personal challenge they're having, yeah, automatically their productivity starts bumping up and their sales goals are being met or whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. So coaching in the business world is becoming really popular. There's business coaching to help people become better at their businesses, but I don't do that. I do. Let me help you with your personal stuff. That's keeping you from being good at your business. And it sounds like it's probably a win-win. They put the money out, but they're getting it back probably more than they're paying out to Yeah. Now all of a sudden they've got an employee who is showing up again, producing, happier in their life. But more importantly, they are like, I have a boss who cares about me. I have a boss who actually cares about me as a human being. And that makes a very loyal employee. Yeah. One that wants to work hard and and pay that back. And so, yeah, it is a win-win and I let the boss have all the credit. So it's, it's just a win-win all the way around. That's amazing. So if you've heard something tonight, 
reach out. Check her out on social media, Rachel Curfew. Uh, do you want to spell that for him? Or? Yes, I will, because I do have that little A at the end that sometimes other Rachels don't have. So it's just R-A-C-H-A-E-L. And then Curfew, just like when you stay out too late, C-U-R-F-E-W. And again, it's um, I'm all over all the big social medias, and or you can just get my personal email, which is rachelcurfew at gmail. Well, and I really appreciate it because I thought that was really cool. I've never had a discussion about anxiety. Awesome. So <laughs> thanks again to Cammie Perkins for her question. And uh, I hope that helped you women out there. Hopefully it helped you men too. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. And uh, when I get home, I'm going to be sure and thank my wife for the things <laughs> that she did today. So awesome. Thanks everybody for, for coming back for another week. We're so grateful to have you here. Um, if you are listening to this podcast tonight, you're struggling and you don't have that safe person to reach out to, call the Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. Someone there will listen and take what you have to say seriously. And so don't ever be afraid to reach out. They're there 365 days, 24-7. Um, but make that call. If you've got that safe person like you talked about, uh, you know, don't be afraid to tell somebody what you're going through. If you've got that person that you can trust, and if you don't, call the lifeline. Again, big shout out tonight to GTM Builders for allowing us to record in this beautiful model home. Again, if you're thinking about building a home, reach out to GTM Builders. Visit them at gtmbuilders.com. And if you're maybe thinking of buying or selling a home, reach out to tonight's sponsor, A. Warner Homes Real Estate. You can reach them at 801-867-5078. They are running a special if you mention that you heard it on the podcast. If you're a veteran or a first responder, and you tell them you heard this uh, message on the podcast tonight, they will pay for your appraisal and your home inspection. Kind of a big deal. So 801-867-5078. Thanks, you guys. And we will see you again next week. Thanks so much.